Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy, and I'm really pleased uh, to have uh, Melanie Sears here today to talk with. Uh, thanks, uh, Melanie, for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I wanted to start off by giving a little bit of background about you. Um, you have a website called uh, dnadialogues.com, and you're a, a nonviolent communication or compassionate uh, communication uh, trainer. Uh, you've been um, working with the Center for Nonviolent uh, Communication since 1991, and uh, you're working in businesses, hospitals, nursing homes, hospice, individuals, couples, and uh, with parents. And uh, you wrote, you're the author of a book, uh, Humanizing Healthcare, Creating Cultures of Compassion with Nonviolent Communication. Um, is there more by way of introduction you'd like to add? Uh, well, I've also written a couple of workbooks called Choose Your Words. Um, one is geared toward family members who have uh, a relative who's been diagnosed with a mental illness. And that looks like this. Uh, and actually, if you wanted a copy of this, I'm the only place that you can get it. And then uh, the other one is also called Choose Your Words, but it's geared toward pro uh, professionals who work with uh, clients who might have a mental illness diagnosis. And uh, you can actually download this from the publisher's website, um, uh, Puddle Dancer Press. Oh, okay, website. great. Yeah. Well, and you can also get a copy from me if you're interested. But those are the two workbooks I've written that kind of go along with my book, Humanizing Healthcare. Yeah, let me just show that book. Uh, this is it on Amazon, uh, Humanizing Healthcare, uh, Creating Cultures of Empathy with Nonviolent Communication. And then this was the other book. So this is your website, uh, dnadialogues.com. Uh, yes. So just for anyone that wants to uh, follow up uh, with you. So um, what I want to talk about is like the overall uh, dialogue that we have is about how do we uh, build a culture of empathy, uh, how do we foster empathy in the world and uh, you know in our personal lives and our families and our communities and in the world at large. So uh, it looks like you've been kind of focusing on um, really the healthcare area with your book at least. Yeah, well, I'm um, a nurse, a registered nurse, and mm. I've been a nurse for more than 30 years. And I've worked in every area of healthcare, and and um, I've found that every time that I work in a different area, the same kind of patterns uh, came up. And so that's kind of what I wrote my book about. What are those patterns that um, create uh, systems that are less than compassionate? Mm -hmm. And how can I um, bring these skills? I've been a trainer for more than 20 years in nonviolent communication. How can I bring my skills into the healthcare system to create more compassionate systems? Mm -hmm. Well, you're you're talking about, about compassionate systems. Um, I've kind of focused on empathy, uh, you know, slash compassion. I'm wondering maybe we could start with uh, a get a sense of how you're defining those terms. Um, I've talked with some of the academics, and I don't know if you, uh, in terms of the words, what these words actually even mean. There's a lot of different kind of definitions, so it's sometimes good just to start with how what you know how we're using the the, the words. That's true, and and many people define find especially uh, empathy in many different ways and a lot of times they get empathy mixed up with sympathy mm -hmm. and um, even in healthcare nurses can be very sympathetic but I've rarely seen them be, be empathetic so I define empathy as uh, as a trainer of nonviolent communication more of the way that Marshall sees it um, Rogers defines it more of really entering Marshall Rosenberg Marshall and Rosenberg. Carl Rogers uh -huh. yes. entering into somebody else's world seeing seeing from the inside out what their world is like basically um, and with Marshall Rosenberg's tools how to put that knowledge that scene into action how to mm. put empathy into action and how to use language in order to demonstrate understanding of what's going on with another person Mm -hmm. So it's uh, then you're you're defining. It. I'll just maybe I can just reflect a little bit since we're talking about Carl Rogers uh, in terms of empathy is kind of uh, going into the experience of someone else 
And then the NVC is kind of giving tools of how you can reflect what it is that you're hearing uh, someone say. And as you empathize your way into their experience, how you can, there are tools to help you reflect what you're hearing that person say. Yes. And, you know, the tools, it's a broad, it's a very broad tool. It's not only giving you language, but it's kind of cleaning up um, areas where uh, problems occur, such as um, how, to, how to keep clear boundaries. I think that's one of the most important uh, pieces of information. Um, how to, because especially when you're being empathetic with somebody, you don't want to be, you don't want to collude with them. You want to empathize with them, and the difference is where the boundary lies, mm -hmm. you know? So collusion sounds more like uh, the, the person says, oh, my boss is an idiot, and collusion would sound like, Something like, oh yeah, you're right, he is, he is kind of a, an idiot. So empathy would sound like the guy says, my boss is an idiot, and empathy would sound like, sounds like you're feeling angry and need recognition. So focusing on the feelings and needs and keeping yourself out of it. So mm -hmm. using language to keep yourself out of the uh, empathy, out of the other person's um, world. And you do that by um, attributing what their feelings are to what their needs are, not to any action that you took. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, feeling your way into their experience, and the, the collusion is, uh, well, let's together, you know, kind of collude. I'm agreeing with you, or I'm disagreeing. Well, collusion would be more, I'm agreeing that the, the boss is an idiot, and you're both judging the person. Yes. And you're kind of like looking at, hearing what the person says and looking at the deeper uh, context of what they're saying, what they're feeling and perhaps what their values are and perhaps what their needs are behind what they're saying, just letting them know that you hear that. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and then it sounds like you're saying that NBC is like a toolbox for doing that, like just some tools of how you can listen more deeply to someone's experience and let them know that you hear what they say. Yes, uh, it, it is a toolbox, and it, it doesn't only contain, you know, the empathy tool. It also contains the honesty tool, and when, you know, when to use either one, uh, how you choose to use language in any moment is part of the toolbox, um, how to take care of yourself, when would you use self-empathy versus empathy for others, when would you use honesty instead of empathy, you know, mm -hmm. how do you, what do you choose to do? So being a chooser uh, is a huge part of learning nonviolent communication, learning to choose and learning how to use language in a way that um, takes care of yourself as you're using it and how to uh, use language that will help get through somebody's blocks. I do that a lot with couples, you know, how to, how to get through people's blocks in communication. Um, and you asked earlier about compassion, you know, and, and part of using this tool set is about maybe getting through those blocks in a compassionate way, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a caring way, uh, caring about that person's needs. Mm -hmm. Well, I heard what I was hearing there is it's about the, uh, not only empathizing with someone else, but also seeing how you feel authentic, authentically. So connecting with your own authentic, authenticity and your own self-empathy and connection with yourself and kind of being able to hold maybe both of those as well. And there's something about blocks that you're wanting to, uh, I wasn't quite clear on something about the blocks to of the other person at the, between two people who are in conflict maybe, or I wasn't quite clear on the block. Okay. Well, let, let me talk about what you said first or um, about really being centered in yourself, and I think that's an essential element, and being able to be present for somebody else is to be present for yourself and, and grounded in your own self. And um, Marsha Rosenberg says when you're giving empathy, you're not present, that the empathy comes through you, but it is not of, of you. Um, so that's, a, that's an important concept, just you know, taking care of your own needs first, taking care of yourself first in any situation. So you don't want to give empathy when you're bleeding yourself, mm -hmm. you know, because then it comes off as patronizing. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like this sense, I mean, I, I know of uh, 
you know, if I'm feeling really aggravated and really angry and then I'm trying to empathize with someone kind of in from that space of anger and all that, that that's, you know, it's going to, they're going to pick up on that underlying anger or irritation or something. And it's going to be hard to kind of empathize and put myself in, in their, you know, feel my way into their experience. Yeah, they, they won't believe your empathy is authentic. Yeah. Well, what, the other part was a, a sense of choice. I was hearing that there's something at some point you can, you have choice or you can choose to do. I wasn't quite clear on how you were tying that in. Um, yeah, knowing in every moment that you had choice. I mean, this is a very empowering um, mm. thing to understand. Um, choice in each moment, what tools you choose to use uh, or whether to use tools at all. Uh, choice in any moment of what you're doing with your life. You know, knowing that you have choice uh, to go to work or not. You know, knowing that that it's a choice, it's not a, a have to. Mm -hmm. So that's a, another uh, MVC teaching the difference, uh, translating have to's to choose to. Mm -hmm. So you were kind of sharing a bit of your uh, experience of, of empathy. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of the academics, the scientists about empathy. And I was mentioning there's a lot of different definitions, you know, kind of floating around. So I thought perhaps, um, and actually one of the kind of the experts, Dan Batson, who I've interviewed, he says, in a conversation, it's good to say how you're using the words and then kind of stick with it. So uh, with that kind of in mind, perhaps I can just share quickly what uh, my kind of definition of empathy okay. is. And I'm seeing it as kind of four major components to empathy. One is that self-empathy, which you were talking about, is that connection to what's going on within myself, That's that sensory awareness, mindfulness of my own experience. And then there's a mirrored empathy, which is through mirror neurons which is, uh, you know, the science of the brain, there's neurons that fire when we do an action as well as when we see an action happen. So as I'm waving my hand, uh, you know, there's neurons in your brain that are firing as if you're, you know, moving your hands as well, like I'm doing. And that's kind of more of a felt experience of someone else uh, using mirror neurons. And then there's the uh, third part, which would be... Um, uh, imaginative empathy, that we can imagine ourselves in someone's situation because we know that we're separate entities, separate beings, and we can take someone else's perspective and feel, imagine what it would be like to be in that situation. And that's the, the metaphor of, you know, standing in someone else's shoes, looking through someone else's eyes. And uh, the mirrored empathy is more like two strings coming in attunement. Uh, with each other. And then the fourth part is empathic action. That as we connect with each other, that we kind of take action where we hold the humanity of each other in the actions that we take. So that's just like a broad um, uh, kind of a perspective, I mean a framework of, I call it the wheel and feel of empathy. So that's the wheel of empathy and the feel is just what does it feel like when we empathize with or are empathized with you know what is the visceral feeling that we personally have and for me it might be warm open creative uh caring etc so just uh, i was wondering how that you know that kind of understanding fits with uh, your understanding of empathy now that kind of um, well i agree with with all that and uh I wouldn't have done this much with empathy if I didn't love empathy. I love the way it feels, and I, I love doing it with other people. Um, I'm actually much better at doing it than I am talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. so, um, but I was just reading a book last night, um, uh, and the, the person related an instant talk about mirror neurons where he was in a restaurant, and he left the restaurant. He was whistling. He goes, why am I feeling so good? And he realized that in the restaurant were these these two men who hadn't seen each other in a long time and were just uh, just very vocal and affectionate and happy. And he, he goes, oh, he must have picked up some of that mm -hmm. happy energy. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of been thinking about that all day. But, uh, yeah, I think, you know, we do pick up this uh, these vibes of other people.
Mm. Uh, well, you, you were kind of starting to talk about that you kind of like the feeling and doing of empathy. I was wondering, as a felt experience, how do you feel empathy? What does it feel like to you when you're empathized with, or you're empathizing, you know, kind of from your visceral felt experience? What, what, what well, when, like? I'm getting, when I'm getting empathy, it feels, um, I feel very uh, free inside. Um, I, uh, and I, I like to get to a place where I feel the, a visceral shift in my body. And that feels very empowering to me. So I think, you know, the getting empathy is more about um, freedom inside to express. Mm -hmm. um, the empathy kind of gives me wings to go wherever I want to go without blocking me in any way. Um, it, it just allows me to, to take my own journey. Mm. And I don't have to worry about the other person or take care of them or shift my focus, you know, which is basically what I do in everyday life, you know, because people don't understand how to use these skills. So that's why it's so valuable for me to be with somebody who's been trained in nonviolent communication because out of all the people that I've engaged with, those people um, – are the ones that are best at being able to provide that empathic space for me to express them. Mm. So it's a, the, the, the feeling of being empathized with, and it's like uh, you're using the metaphor of wings. You have wings, you can kind of be free, and there's a sense of freedom. And movement. And movement, kind of, yeah. Yeah, and uh, when I empathize with others, it's also very fun for me. It's... Um, I feel a sense of connection with them. I feel a sense of respect um, and it just um, of understanding, kind of a, almost a mutual understanding. Uh, when, I, when I've worked with people, uh, from clients, you know, giving empathy for over a period of time, um, there's a shared um, fondness develops mm -hmm. between us. Mm -hmm. So it's like a sense of a real connection and a, a fondness sounds like a real caring kind of a uh, kind of a connection yeah. with the others. Yeah. Yeah, and, and an understanding, and um, then a certain amount of ease follows. So, like, even if I hadn't seen that person for a year or two, when we got together, we would just like take off where we left, you know, and be able to talk about whatever, you know. So it develops a certain sense of trust and connection. Mm -hmm. So, wow, you've really gone into all these experiences. So there's like a sense of connection, a sense of freedom, sense of wings, sense of ease, a sense of, uh, of caring. So those are kind of like the visceral feelings and qualities that, and, that you're experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, another way with the feeling part of it, um, I find that kind of metaphors are kind of a fun way to uh, kind of look at it. Uh, you already kind of used the metaphor of the wings, right? So the empathy is kind of like having wings, and like the sense of freedom. And uh, for me, empathy is kind of like a cornucopia in the sense that, uh, you know, a cornucopia is this horn of plenty, and there's just these different fruits and lovely things kind of coming out of it. And that's the same kind of uh, experience for me in terms of empathizing with someone or kind of being empathized with is there's just this unfolding of this richness of, of experience and emotions and sensations that, uh, uh, that kind of come up. Yeah, it, it is. It, it does feel very rich, and it's never boring. I'm, <laughs> I'm always engaged when I'm uh -huh. uh, doing empathy or receiving empathy. I mean, if my, if my energy drops in a workshop or something and I get some empathy, my energy will pick right back up. Mm -hmm. But I did want to mention one of the effects of empathy that I've seen over and over again with people that I've empathized with and in my own experience early on in receiving empathy I found that when I received empathy something would shift in me and and then it, I would notice that it shifts in the outside world too so maybe I was having um, problems with the same issue over and over again and I get some in empathy about that issue and I would shift and then I go, okay, now I'm ready to deal with it. And I'd never have to deal with it again because my experience of the outside world would have changed. Hmm. And um, 
I don't know if that's clear, but I'll, I'll make another example that might be more clear. So I was, uh, wor I was working with this woman when I lived, I lived in Maui for eight months, and I was working with this woman, and she was having um, conflict with her neighbor, and I was giving her empathy. So for about an hour and a half, I just empathized with her point of view about this conflict. And uh, she hadn't talked to this neighbor for uh, two years because the neighbor was really mad at them for building a structure that kind of blocked their view or something. But the next morning, the neighbor called her. And um, so it's a, it was a coincidence, but I, I don't believe it's a coincidence. I, I believe that she cleared something, some block, and then that welcomed that energy to come in. Mm. I talked to uh, Ike Lassiter um, once, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a NBC trainer, and he talked about the clunk. And I'm wondering just that there's something that when you're, I don't know if you're saying it's in all empathic listening or just in a conflict, that you're kind of listening, you're hearing, and then there's kind of a shift of some experience. And he's kind of calling it the clunk that you kind of, is, is that kind of where you're going with this, that there's like a, if you're in conflict, that there's a shift, or is it just in general relating? That there's no, a... I, I think it's, a, I think there, a shift happens. It doesn't have to be in conflict. It can be an internal shift that happens in a person when they're receiving empathy. That um, it, It's almost, well, I also believe that the world is our mirror, so when we change something inside of us, our mirror changes. Oh, I see. So in this case, this woman was had had some kind of a shift in her understanding, uh, uh, her experience, and even though uh, she hadn't even talked to this other person, it kind of radiated out into the, the world. It was kind of like this mirror, and it created this new kind of relationship between her and, and this person that uh, then contacted her. Yes. Yeah, I've seen that a few times, and it's very interesting. And mm. Sounds a little woo-woo. I know, it does sound woo-woo. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> I could see if it happening in relationship, you know, because someone sees the change happen in you, but you're saying it can even kind of radiate uh, out through the ethers or made or some other cause and effect form that's kind of shifting. Well, yeah. Well, you know, they've even shown uh -huh. that... Um, the energy does affect uh, a lot of uh, people and experience. Like when there's a group, there was a group of meditators going to Washington D.C. and they were there for the weekend. And during the time when they were meditating, the violence in that area was significantly decreased. Mm. So, I do believe that energy has an effect uh -huh. on the world. Yeah, so if we can kind of change the general energy that others around will change. And I've heard uh, kind of like studies in terms of if you're feeling happy, that there's like this this uh, kind of wave of happiness that the person you're immediately connecting with, that they kind of will, their happiness level will rise. And then the people they meet, it their level will rise. And it kind of, kind of dissipates, but then it kind of, echoes out. So it'd be also if you're stressed that that will kind of ripple out. So these emotions kind of ripple through maybe even through mirror neurons one way yeah. that people kind of pick up the energy like you were talking about the uh, the guy that was in the restaurant and he saw these happy this happy couple and he felt happy when he left. Yeah yeah after reading that last night I really want to spend more time around happy people. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I, uh, I work uh, part-time in a psychiatric hospital where everybody's really unhappy, and I just worry about the effect that has on my psyche. Just oh, yeah. People all the time. Yeah, you're around this environment where these people in the, in the psychiatric uh, space where they're in maybe a lot of stress and so forth and unhappy, and then you feel like, wonder how, how that kind of affects your experience, too. Yeah. It's having that ripple effect. Yeah, and I, I'm tired after working there, and I, I, it's not the physical work. I, I think it's the energetic work of, of just working with that population. Yeah. Well, when you mentioned that you were uh, a nurse, my partner is a registered nurse as well, and, uh, you know, she's in infectious disease uh, control kind of in, in, in that area, but in terms of her work, she really loved her work, and it was always the relationship of the, you know, in the medical field, it's so hierarchical and 
and can be very authoritarian that um, it was like the relationships that were the things that were really burning her out and then you know coming home she's like in tears and I'm having to sit and listen you know for half an hour an hour just kind of hearing all the stresses and strains that she is kind of going through so it's a really can be a really uh, difficult environment that healthcare field yes you know and that's one reason I wrote the book because you know these people spend so much of their lives in that environment you know especially people that work full-time like I don't really know how they do it energetically um, but you know what I see is that they become kind of deadened and really burnt out you know so you know my interest is how to how to keep our aliveness you know what do we need to do to keep our spirit alive working in a domination systems because most of our systems are domination mm -hmm. systems and especially healthcare is a huge domination system and there's a tight grasp on that system it's it's not easy for um, healthcare systems to let go of that for various reasons so the the nurses and the healthcare workers you know are subjected to working in these systems that are quite toxic and painful on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis to work in there's no room for conflict re resolution between employees, between managers. Um, there's no um, room for uh, communication. Uh, if something stressful happens, there's no place to get any empathy. You can't even call a friend because, you know, you're, you're limited in what your breaks are, you know, and your cell phone usually doesn't work in the, mm -hmm. in the building, you know, and, you know, it's just hard to even get five minutes to yourself. So, you know, how to, my interest is really, you know, what can we do to, to make a system that nurtures the workers better and, you know, that's, that's one reason I wrote that book. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's really, I mean, you used the, the magic word for me, say, creating cultures of compassion, and that's what I've even named, you know, our organization, the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, is a... Uh, it sounds like you're attuned to that too, that you're, the whole culture kind of supports kind of ways of being and how do we change that, that culture. Uh, so I'm really yeah. curious, like how are you seeing, I mean, you're, it's a really difficult uh, uh, field. I mean, it's especially difficult one is healthcare. So mm -hmm. how do you, how, 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 what's your uh, kind of approach for changing that culture? Well, the, the current culture demands a certain communication patterns that keep the systems in place, such as uh, it doesn't really acknowledge feelings and needs, um, especially of its employees. It doesn't really want employees to be expressing feelings and needs. And yet they, they do expect the employees to um, be empathetic to the patients. And it's, pretty, it's almost impossible to be empathetic to the patients when you're not getting empathy yourself. So changing that culture, I, I just looked at it from a language viewpoint. Um, how can we, if we implement nonviolent communication into those cultures and change the language, it will also change the consciousness of the culture. Mm, so you're kind of focusing on the, uh, the languaging then, like uh, changing the way people use language within the culture? Yeah. Teach, teaching empathy skills, teaching people how to express honesty because in our culture, in our society, we've really forgotten how to be honest. I mean, we, some people are honest with their judgments, oh, you're an idiot. So that's a mm -hmm. level of honesty, but there's a deeper level of honesty than that, and that's uh, the honesty of your feelings and needs. So if somebody's thinking you're an idiot, there's feelings and needs going on underneath. I'm feeling scared right now and I need some empathy. You would never hear anybody express that level of honesty unless they've taken NBC class. Mm -hmm. But that is the level of uh, expression that would create connections between people to be well, that vulnerable. Well, you know, I've interviewed uh, a lot of people within the NBC community, and there's this language around needs. But th that language is not very common in the uh, large the culture, the extended culture. Uh, Sometimes people use the words maybe values, you know, instead of needs, and some people are, you know, are, there's kind of discussion about that as a vocabulary. And, you know, I've interviewed uh, academics and scientists, and they don't use the vocabulary of needs 
Uh, but what they do talk about is intention. Uh, so I've been trying to map the, you know, the kind of what the academic scientists have been saying with uh, NBC, you know, the vocabulary around needs. And I'm wondering if intention, that uh, needs is kind of like, uh, is like what your underlying intention is. I don't know if, if that kind of makes sense or if you have any I like the word that. intention. And when I first uh, received empathy and nonviolent communication, that's what I took away is, oh, my intentions were finally understood. Mm. That was a big, big painful thing for me growing up is that my intentions were not understood. So I do like the word intention. And I also want to educate people about what their needs are because if you can separate language, which I think NBC does, it separates language and get clear about your needs, then you have more, more options to meet those needs. So I don't know. I guess you could use intention too, but uh, needs is, um, I, I think it's just good to educate ourselves about the needs, uh -huh. the human common needs, and also uh, educate ourselves about feeling words so that we have a vocabulary to express ourselves. And this becomes very important for our mental health, to be able to express our inner world. And this is what I find with psychiatric patients is, um, you know, they'll go in for ECT treatments or take medications. But what I've seen is they don't know how to verbally express their inner world. So instead of getting the empathy they need, they try to repress those feelings and needs, almost making the feelings the enemy or the, you know, something that they don't want. And um, and what I've done with that population when I've worked with them is to give them this vocabulary and then they can start expressing what's going on with them, what's so upsetting, what's creating all this pain in them. Yeah, I would uh, connect that. What's coming up for me is connecting that with uh, self-empathy. So, and I use kind of like the metaphor of self-empathy. It's kind of like we all have a spring or a fountain of experience that's coming up within us. And uh, it's like being able to put vocabulary to that spring of experience. And that's what I'm kind of like seeing what you're talking about, the feelings, that that spring is the spring of ongoing, evolving feelings. And if we can't... Uh, you know, have a vocabulary for that translated into uh, words, we can maybe share it, you know, through our just visceral, you know, sensations, but to be able to translate it into a word, like, you know, anger or detachment or anxiety or whatever is coming up, to have a word for that and to be able to share that with a word somehow releases it or lets it kind of unfold or makes it more accessible. Yeah, um, all our feelings, according to Christian uh, Northrup, all our feelings are biochemical reality in our body. So we have these feelings that creates a biochemical reality for us, and if we don't express it in some way, it's going to express itself. You know, maybe it'll cause us to get sick, or it'll express itself in you know physically instead of verbally. And I believe that if we can express those feelings verbally, then we're we're going to be healthier human beings. And well, I also believe that empathy is a, a a need, a human need that we all need empathy. And it's almost a four letter word in our culture. Yeah. Well, using that metaphor again of the spring. Yes. Um, that there's it's. I mean, one metaphor is that the spring can get blocked. You know, it's like you know, it can get stones and garbage can get kind of kind. Of to plug up that spring and that it's uh that it's like how do we unplug that spring of experience and there's something about and so it can kind of flow so our feelings can kind of flow towards each other and kind of be seen by others and that unplugging of the, the i think you're using the word blocks and yes, so you yes. can see that that spring that fountain getting blocked yes yeah and, yeah I, I don't, you know, we we're. I started talking about blocks early in this conversation, and and um, yeah, how do you, you know, to unblock that spring that you're talking about? Um, sometimes it takes some skill. Sometimes that spring that spring's been blocked for you know a long time, you know, and and it it takes some patience to unblock that spring.
Mm -hmm. So you got to have uh, the patience and maybe the tools as well to. Yeah. And one of the tools is somehow to put uh, words and vocabulary to those the things that are in that spring. To it, somehow that that has putting words to it seems to uh, facilitate the flow of it. Yeah, um, and also what I found uh, is effective is kind of switching up empathy with honesty. Like mm -hmm. a, if I'm working with somebody who has a blocked spring, I'll use your mm -hmm. there. <laughs> metaphor. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, kind of using some empathy and then using some honesty. It's kind of like um, getting the engine started again or something. Uh, almost like, you know, EMDR, I've, I've thought that uh, using NVC in a very skillful way is almost like the, how EMDR balances both sides of your body and your brain. And it, using NVC and empathy and honesty switching back I think also does that. I'm not familiar with EMDR. What that is? It's a um, it's a tool for healing trauma. Oh, uh -huh. and it's uh, you know like you can go for a walk um, and you're moving both sides of your body and as you walk, uh, there's a book I'm I'm thinking when I speak this. It's called Walking Your Blues Away. As you walk, you think about this problem that you're you're working on, and as you walk by moving both sides of your body. It begins to integrate that experience. Mm, mm -hmm. So yeah, you, sorry. Oh, Go ahead. it's just that yeah, there's a, a notion or that our thoughts are embodied. They're like they're within our whole body. It's like a thought's not kind of some detached, you know, uh, you know, detached thing somewhere, you know, outside of us. That every thought has a has a physical manifestation, even if it's just neurons. And those neurons tend to connect to the whole body, so those thoughts have like echoes within the whole body. And then, if we're moving, we're kind of like moving that uh, that body, which is kind of affecting the thoughts, kind of something like along those lines. That sounds uh, like a good way of explaining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's like if you if you're feeling depressed, you go take a walk. And kind of being in the fresh air, you know, seeing nature, it can kind of shift your your inner experience. Yeah, well, you know, there's always there's a saying that say change your change your belief, change your thought, change your reality. So I, that's partially what happens there, I think. And also, um, supposedly uh, EMDR, and I believe nonviolent communication also helps. Uh, build neurons between the amygdala and the hippocampus in the brain, which sometimes when somebody's traumatized, this is what I've read, they, those n neurons get kind of inhibited or stuck. So I think by giving empathy, you encourage those neurons to, to um, develop a pathway that may not have been there before. Um, that's kind of interesting because uh... Uh, we in our in one of what we do we have this process called empathy circles where yeah. we do kind of empathic listening kind of in a group setting um, with you know small groups and someone had a, a problem they, they they had two parts of themselves that they were seeing one part was kind of their creativity and then the other part was kind of like their uh, judgment of the creativity that was like judging it yeah and then they didn't. They didn't want to take any action. The person, because every time they take an action, they had the creativity. Then the judge would come in. They feel this sense of pain around, you know, doing these things. And then I said, I just don't ever going to do it because I don't want to deal with the pain that's coming up. So we did some role taking where I was the person's creativity. Someone else was their uh, their judgment. And then we had an empathic dialogue with each other so um, so you know I was saying what it was like to be creative the judgment was empathizing first but before judging and then I was like empathizing with the judgments and so we we're kind of doing this empathic dialogue between the you know these component parts of this person and she just she felt it like it integrated the two parts and yeah. I'm just kind of speculating it's the same thing that maybe we have like a neural empathic connections 
And then we can take conflict and connect those conflicts into that neural way of being, of empathic, that we kind of like heal and heal that. I'm maybe getting a little far afield here, but... Yeah, um, no, definitely. Um, I do empathy groups also, and we work, we call those, the judgment part, we call those jackals. Uh -huh. and, um, because Marshall Rosenberg used, began, in his process, he uses a giraffe to illustrate nonviolent communication principles, and he uses a jackal to illustrate a kind of the normal way that we've been programmed to speak over the last 10,000 years. So those judgments, those judgmental voices I call jackals, and we, we play with the jackals, and we, we find out what the life-serving message is underneath, mm -hmm. all underneath the jackals. And um, we do all kind of role plays and, and stuff with them. And people, uh, be, I think you're right, people begin to integrate those parts of them that they didn't want to own before because they were seeing it as negative parts of themselves, you know, or judgmental parts of themselves. But um, all our jackals, I think, moving toward wellness is about integrating all parts of ourselves, and that includes kind of our shadow side, which I would call some of our jackals, and you know the parts that are um, more accepted by culture. Mm, so the jackal is like a metaphor for judgment and yes. what judgment is, and then you're having like dialogues with that yeah. role plays with the different parts, and you can. And that uh, the, that dialogue, that's my experience too, is the dialogue is like an integrative process. It creates this sense of, you know, going deeper and then kind of not judging the judger, you know, not judging the jackal, but really hearing what the that judgment is trying to say. And, you know, there's, it has it. It has it, your uh, well-being in mind. It's not doing it just to be mean. It's doing it to yes. necessarily to offer something and to hear what that's offering. Yeah. 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 So, so like a jackal that says, uh, uh, oh, you're being stupid. Maybe that jackal is wanting acceptance. Maybe that jackal is scared that, you know, because his need for acceptance is not being met by what you're doing, you know. So... So that would be the positive message behind the jackal. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there's a, um, I don't, I can't remember the person's name. I think he's in England and he works with the uh, population uh, with mental illness and he works with uh, people's voices. So um, the, it's a va fascinating if I could remember, Rollo May, something like that if you've ever seen his website, but he uh, gives an illustration about talking to this one patient's uh, voices, who was very, this voice was very disconnected from the person. She heard it, you know, coming at her from the outside, and as he worked with her and listened to the voice and had a dialogue with the voice, hmm. she began to integrate this voice, and it became, became her champion instead of I think it began to tell her, you know, as it, the beginning was to tell her that she needed to commit suicide or something. But at the as he worked with it, it became kind of her champion, and she integrated it. So even you know our jackals that we're aware of and the ones that we have totally disowned that come to us from the outside, we can work with those and and begin to integrate all of that. So is the integration really having that dialogue then? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's like having that empathic dialogue. Yeah. Like it's not just, there's, you know, there's typical in, in psychology, they have all these role playings where, you know, you have the different parts of yourself. Or I used to live at Esalen Institute where Gestalt therapy was big. And it's like, you know, go beat the pillow, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're ever familiar with Gestalt, but there's, a, it's a little bit where you have the parts, your, your parts just kind of dialoguing it out. But what I've been looking at is where the parts, you actually get them to empathize with each other and instead of just kind of battling it out, that they actually, you know, if you're, if you're going to fight with the pillow, that you first empathize with the pillow and the em pillow empathizes with you before you slug it or whatever. Yeah, yeah, having um, an empathetic dialogue. Yeah. Empathetic dialogue, not just any old dialogue. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. And also just knowing how to use the tools um, to create that dialogue. 
Well, how, how's your experience been in the in the healthcare then? How, in terms of, I mean, you've written a book on it. You've, you know, it seems like that's your area. How how is the uh, development and movement and success or, you know, struggles of, of working in the healthcare and working? Well, um, let's see. Um, I, I had a student who took my ideas and integrated it into her unit uh, for into a forensic unit where the patients were the um, most violently mentally ill patients uh, in the state. And, um, and she, inter she taught everyone NVC in that unit and um, she did some other things with NVC. And pretty soon, well at first no one wanted to work on that unit because it was a violent unit, it was had terrible energy there, um, it wasn't safe. But as the experiment went on, the patients actually started getting better and were transferred to uh, less intense uh, areas of care. And um, it became the most popular unit to work on. Hmm. So, um, and she kept some statistics. Like she thought when she started the experiment that the violence rate would be decreased by 1%. The violence rate um, by the statistics kept by the institution such as um, use of restraints and seclusion, um, those indicators decreased by about 50% within a year. So that's how powerful it was for her to integrate these tools into that unit. How did she, uh, what was the process of integrating it? You know, how did that look? Well, she taught, um, first she taught the uh, psychologists and the um, professional staff the tools and then she, every a couple of times a week they would have a meeting with the patients and the staff and she would um, she would begin to teach nonviolent communication. She would like bring a beach ball and put feeling words on it and you know so she would do these different things. Um, she would teach people about needs. They, she, would, she opened up the dialogue to define what is violence, you know. At first uh, violence was defined by you know just physical acts of violence but um, as they got deeper into the conversation, you know, they found that violence, inc you know, increased to include other things such as um, glaring at somebody, you know, posturing, <coughs> um, a variety of, um, of deeper meanings. So people began, began to develop an awareness of what was violence and they began to develop awareness of how to use language to express what was going on inside of them. They also began to take responsibility for creating the safety of the unit. It wasn't just the staff's responsibility, but it was also the responsibility of the patients. Their, you know, their input was requested to uh, what do we need to do to create a safe environment. Hmm. Well, one thing I've been looking at, like uh, in terms of uh, building a culture of empathy, is I know there's NVC kind of as a process, but it seems to be a little bit like a bit of a standalone process. And I'm kind of, I try to be very eclectic to bring in all the different processes that I can find. That, and organizing around empathy is kind of like the intention. Uh, so that building a culture of empathy is what is kind of set as a clear intention. And to use, you know, just any process that helps foster that, uh, that environment um, and sometimes I have a little bit of trouble kind of like integrating NBC that sometimes NBC is um, I don't know it seems to be it seems to be kind of like standalone in some way it seems to be have its own world uh, for example NBC is not in the academic world the real kind of a studied or kind of incorporated kind of a process. So I'm kind of trying to make sense and understand that. I'm just wondering, what do you think about that in terms of, you know, where it's like the intention of a culture of empathy versus, you know, kind of focusing on needs and, and uh, kind of, I don't know, the, do you know what I mean? It's like, how do you kind of integrate those two? It sounds like you, you want to create a culture of empathy without specifically using NVC tools to do that, that you want to bring in other processes, is that what you're saying? 
yeah, I want it to be kind of eclectic so that we use just all that we have the intention and then NBC is kind of like more of a process yeah. um, that, you know, one, it's one process. We can use that or use parts of it um, or we can use, you know, art or we can use dance or we can use, uh, you know, or creating these empathy circles, which is more of the originally more like, uh, you know, Carl Rogers reflective listening approaches. So to have it kind of be a broader spectrum, setting it as the intention of empathy, as the as the uh, you know the creating a culture of empathy. So um, and sometimes I see NBC uh, is uh, kind of like almost like a a philosophy, like a philosophical statement, um, and with uh, and using empathy to kind of foster that philosophical. Uh, premise, I guess, that you know everything is needs. That life is all about trying to uh, nurture, you know, meet our needs. Yeah. So well, I'm no, just like I, struggling a little bit, trying to understand and have be able to articulate that. That that. Uh, well, I, I like that um, that you're you're wanting to bring in other things like art is so wonderful. Music therapy is you know, just a wonderful way to reach parts of us that wouldn't otherwise be able, we'd be able to reach, you know, so I like bringing all that in, um, touch, you know, therapeutic touch, uh, Reiki, I, I love all that, um, and I love, <clears throat> well, of course, I love NBC, too, I love the tools of it, and uh, I think having an intention of empathy is one thing, but it's not, it's not always empathy that's needed, sometimes honesty is needed. Mm -hmm. um, so for example I had this patient and <clears throat> she had this um, they called it a delusional disorder because uh, she was always uh, she complained of pain and there was nothing that anybody could do about it and, and anyway they called it a delusional disorder and I noticed when I gave her empathy she would get more into the pain and crying and stuff and it just never seemed to go anywhere mm. with her and she, she and the other people, the other nurses would give her empathy, and she started to cry all the time, and and uh, cry loudly, and it was very disruptive for the unit. So I started to um, set limits with her and express some honesty with her, and it was only then that that I felt that we started having a real conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's one of the parts, uh, you know, with the empathic listening and empathy. Uh, if you kind of if we go back to, like, Carl Rogers' approach, it was like putting within a therapist-client, client-therapist kind of framework. So the therapist would empathize with the client. The client would get kind of, you know, try to have some growth, and then they would go home. And for me, that's always been, like, only half of the empathy part that the – for, it's actually that the client in that situation needed to also listen to the therapist mm -hmm. in a in an equal kind of a context, and so that's what I'm kind of hearing. What you're saying is you're empathizing, empathizing with her, but you're not. She's not empathizing with you, and so she's only doing half of the empathy experience, and it, so she kind of needed to learn to empathize and hear you because otherwise it becomes, it, it seems like the empathy can kind of just feed someone's narcissism. Or <laughs> well, you know, Martin Buber was one of the uh, influences for Marshall Rosenberg and he's all about having that kind of authentic dialogue with somebody, um, not just one, not just empathy flowing one way, but yeah. you know, it being a two-way street and there being a meeting between the two people. And sometimes I, I think that with my clients that I've spent a lot of time empathizing with, I mean, they love me, of course, because I'm giving them empathy, but they don't really know me. Mm -hmm. It's about them that they love, you know, and if the empathy was a, if it was a real exchange of empathy and honesty and shared empathy, <coughs> that there would be more of a, a maybe an authentic, authentic meeting. Um, and Marshall Rosenberg was known, <laughs> and actually I experienced this a lot with him. I was fortunate because I've been studying NBC for more than 20 years, and back in the old days we um, would get together with like 20 people in a group with Marshall. 
And he was kind of known for um, expressing um, his honesty in the midst of uh, in the midst of empathy. And uh, he did that with me a couple times, and it was a very powerful learning experience. It, you know, it was like it really blew me away. Um, and his honesty, it was giraffe honesty. It's like I'm feeling uh, angry right now, and I need you know some recognition for what I'm trying to do, something like that. You know, um, and people would be all mad at Marshall. <laughs> they say, how can you say that to him? <laughs> but to me, when he directed that honesty toward me, it was a very uh, good growth experience for me. And also it made me feel trusted. It made me feel respected. It made me feel that there was really an authentic dialogue going on. Mm. So what would you do? Would you kind of empathize, reflect back what you're hearing, or how would, how would you respond to that? I, I mean, I'm hearing that you felt good about it being like it felt authentic to you. You're really hearing what he had to say. I was kind of like wondering what was your, how did you uh, react or act? Well, the <laughs> one time I'm thinking of, uh, I mean, I would have loved to have been able to uh, empathize with him right away, but I think one time I'm thinking of, I was pretty shocked and <laughs> he gave me some empathy for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I've seen at times that I can empathize with him, and and um, and I think it's kind of an advanced skill, too, when when someone's expressing that level of honesty with you, um, if you're able to empathize with what's going on with them. Uh, yeah, the, it, especially with someone if you're in a group like that, he's a person who has power, the insight, the wisdom, and I can see that. I would imagine it could be easy to be intimidated and you know, yeah. kind of like close up and no, oh, you know, I'm, and then to be in a state where well, I'm hearing, you know, Marshall, I'm hearing you're really frustrated and ang angry that you're really, you know, you're needing something here. Am I hearing you correctly or? Yeah. Yeah. It would have that, been wonderful if I could have done that at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I, oh, I'd be sorry. able to now, but anyway. You, pardon, what was that? I may be able to do that at this point in my empathy uh, experience, but. You know, at the time, I was very, I was a young giraffe. Uh -huh. Well, that's what, why I've been kind of focusing on this uh, kind of mutual empathy that uh, it's exactly for this, because I kind of got to it, uh, because you were talking about honesty, that uh, you as the listener, you also want to be honest. And, you know, Carl Rogers talked about that, you know, with, I think he used the word congruence, which I think is just another word for honesty, authentic. Yeah. as the, the listener, but it seems like if you have, uh, you know, kind of a mutual empathy that, you know, I can share some, if you're, I feel heard and reflected, and then it's the turn of the other person to do the same, and then you kind of go back and forth, it means there's no, you know, client, there's no therapist, it's just us kind of practicing empathic listening. So that's what I've been trying to develop in an empathy, we call them empathy circle, you know, process, so it's like small groups, you know, four or five maximum in a circle, and it's just back and forth empathic listening to keep, so you do both sides of the coin, I guess, I'm just using the metaphor of the coin, of being the listener and the speaker, and you're kind of going back and forth, so you're doing both sides of it. Yeah, the way, the way I do that in my empathy um, groups is <clears throat> that somebody... So is ask for empathy about something and the whole group will practice their empathy skills and give that person empathy and then at some point when I notice the person has stopped talking or there seems to be a shift um, we ask the group how do people feel about what was shared and then it's the time for the people in the group to practice their honesty skills mm. you know, what what was triggered in them by what this person shared what you know how are they feeling about it? So, um, so that sounds similar to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if I'm hearing, here's a, here you have a, a circle or a group. One person shares in the group. Different people are reflecting back, empathizing uh, with the speaker until they're, they're kind of done. It could be yes. 20 minutes, half an hour. Yeah. And then each person in the circle would just share what kind of arise, come up for them. 
And do you reflect that, or you just have them say it? Um, well, no, they just say it because it, as a facilitator, it's important to track whose needs are on the table. And at that point, the needs of the person getting the empathy originally, her needs are still on the table. So if I were to shift into giving empathy to somebody who is expressing their honesty about their reaction, oh, I see. I would shift that the focus from the person whose needs, and that person may need empathy, but I would check back with the original person and say, well, are you complete enough that we can now move to this other person? So that's just a facilitator's thing. Does okay. that make sense? I yeah, it's so that the, well, I was hearing that the, the person speaks for 20, 30, whatever it is, mm. uh, they're not complete yet. It's like the reflection is part of, of the contributing to them becoming complete in terms of feeling fully heard. Yes. And that's so it's part of that their process of yeah. of their experience. Um, yeah, when somebody shares deeply, they feel vulnerable in a group and it really helps then to know how people are reacting to them. Mm. And they need that really almost always in order to feel complete. And once they get that, then they're they're they feel more complete and then we can move on to the next person. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, uh, you know, I've been looking at the empathic listening, and there's a lot of different ways of kind of structuring it. There could be just, you know, one person is, in, you know, in distress or really needing to talk, and I'm just listening to them, reflecting what I'm hearing for as long as it takes for them to kind of be heard. Then there's another part where, well, then, you know, I will share, they will reflect uh, until I feel heard, then they speak until they feel heard. And it was kind of like this back and forth kind of process. Then you can add another person, and it can be you can choose between who it is that you're listening to and and who's reflecting, and it kind of ping pongs back. So there seems to be all kinds of like limitless manifestations of how you can structure these uh, groups. It could be one person speaking, the whole group reflecting. Uh, so there's there's a lot of different ways of really kind of uh, structuring. So you're thing. saying with your empathy circles, one, like one person <coughs> is getting empathy and then maybe that triggers another person, so then you move to that person, give them empathy, and then maybe another person gets triggered? Uh, no, it's more like uh, we, we, the, the empathy circles that we're doing, we start the circle with um, uh, how can we build a culture of empathy? So we set, actually set our intention, the whole container is around fostering empathy you know in ourselves between ourselves and with the whole world and then we kind of just say well how can we build that culture of empathy and one person starts sharing where, where they are and then but they choose someone in the circle to speak to and that person reflects back what they're hearing until the speaker feels fully you know heard like they don't have any it tends to come to a point where they feel like I've said enough or want to give other people a chance. There's, so there comes a point where they feel like they've been heard to their satisfaction. Yeah. Then the uh, listener, it's their turn to speak about whatever's kind of coming up for them. Okay. And then, but they get to choose who does the reflection. Yeah. So it's always a one-on-one. -on -one. I see. And then that person reflects back, and then it just keeps ping-ponging, you know, kind of back and forth for maybe an hour and a half. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're doing, and, and um, you know, I see the possibilities of that. And I think you're, you're skipping that, that step that's so important to, to see how people are reacting to what we've shared. Uh -huh. I think that's a really important piece. So. I see. So it's like somebody's sharing, and what is everyone's reaction to, yeah. to that person? Yeah. Um, hmm. All right, that's a, well, I kind of see it as a platform, you know, and that we can keep incorporating all these different ideas. So mm -hmm. I'm actually going to maybe incorporate that into... Yeah, give it a try and see yeah. how it feels to you. So um, is there anything else? We've gone for, you know, about an hour, which I like to do for the, you know, interviews. And uh, uh, is there something you feel we should cover that we haven't covered? Um, I could talk for hours. I'm available <laughs> for talking as long as you want to talk about. This is my favorite topic. And I'm really learning a lot, actually, from talking with you about the nitty gritty of, you know, how you work your circles and all that. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, it's not my favorite way, as I said before, of 
of expressing uh, these tools. My favorite way is to just be present to someone. And then by doing that, that other person knows kind of what I know by the way I listen, by the way I react. Um, so that, and that's a way to, that somebody can learn it from the inside out without me articulating it um, in a way that they can maybe get on the head level. And I believe as, especially as adult learners, that we need, in order to learn something, we need to um, learn it from the inside out. We need to um, kind of uh, have our experience um, it mingled with the, the learning. So that's, that's my favorite way of training and teaching these skills. And um, So this has been a bit of a dialogue about empathy and yeah. you, you would like to actually have a, a process where you're doing empathic listening and someone can really experience it and viscerally feel what it's like to be empathized with and be heard. Yeah, I would, lo I would love to do an interview like that. <laughs> um, how we, we could do another one? Uh, would you like like me to speak, or you would like to speak, or how would you, how would we kind of set that up? Because I I'd love to do uh, just you know the actual doing of it. Uh, well, um, I mean at another time we can kind of take yeah, a yeah. break and. I um, mean either either way, um, uh, I I don't know either way would work for me either me receiving empathy or you receiving empathy. Uh -huh. But um, so well, I would love to receive empathy for like half an hour or whatever. <laughs> well, that'd be great. I'd love to give you empathy. For okay. Half an hour or something, and uh -huh. maybe you could give me empathy for a half an hour. Okay, let's do that. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can. Let's. We'll end this call and uh, just arrange it uh, on uh, via email, and we'll set up something in the next week or two, and. Uh, do that if that works for you. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay, Melanie, then uh, thanks for uh, sharing this. This has really been wonderful. I really love the, you know, the, the hands-on, you know, what you have and your experience. I'm looking forward to our next, uh, our next step here. Yeah, me too. <laughs> thanks so much.